Hi, welcome back to Pirates of Savannah audiobook. You are now entering Chapter 21. I hope you've enjoyed the ride. And please consider going over to lupolink.com and purchasing the book or buying a product or helping me survive in some way. Thanks. Chapter 21, Charlestown. Bandage. Whoremaster Darden belted out. You mean Mariana's family, Patrick questioned. Correct. He is some sort of distant relative to them and lives near Charlestown in South Carolina. He has made a small fortune in Indigo and is a brother in the Freeman Society. I sent word to be on the lookout to help a fellow brother. Captain, this was very expensive information to obtain, Miss Darden hinted. April reached into her pouch and handed her a large handful of silver. This should cover the cost, as always, dear. Great work. Sam, take us to Charlestown immediately. Well, husband, it is time you got better acquainted with our daughter and meet the rest of the crew. The group left the table and headed topside as the scullery wench Teresa came in and cleaned up. Patrick tripped over a black cat as it whipped between his legs. <coughs> Lady Bias, please bring Tracy to us. A woman with extremely long brown hair and a throng of children following her appeared. She was holding a shy girl with red curly hair. Tracy raised both arms out, reaching for her mother. The child wore nothing but a linen nappy. This is your daddy, Tracy. Give him a hug and a kiss, April said in a high-pitched voice. Patrick leaned in for a hug. The baby was frightened by his scarred face and recoiled, hiding her face in her mother's armpit. April sighed and made an excuse for the little redhead. Well, give it time. She is a shy one. We hope she'll be talking any day now. This Sparky is mind-touched. I would expect this craziness from a transport ship, but not a pirate vessel. <coughs> Look at all the women, cats, and children everywhere. Patrick barked. Well, these women are widows or single mothers of bastard children. They had to bring their children along because they have nowhere else to go. Actually, the older ones are very useful. They help cook, clean, fish, and a few of them are excellent cabin boys. Over here are some of the whores you already know. This be Roxanne, our Persian beauty. And you remember the toast of France, Miss Tiffany. We have six more women around here somewhere, but they must be below deck right now. The two women waved at Patrick as April continued. Of course, you already met the lovely Teresa earlier. The captain continued her tour. There are two more ladies who we picked up in our travels. This one is a German woman with a busy mouth on her. First time I saw her, I was smuggling muskets to our network in Charlestown. She was on display in the center of town with her head and hands sticking out of the stocks. She was cussing in German about how evil the king's government was. Then, two weeks later, I come back and she's sticking out of a pillory. She was still cussing at the redcoats walking by, asking them if they would do this to their children. I knew she was our kind of people and asked her to escape her life and join us. Say hello to Miss Bleich. Patrick waved at the woman who was busy writing in a book. I think she's writing a book about liberty and personal freedom in German, but none of us can understand her enough to know for sure. Over here, this attractive blonde young lady is named Audrey Scott. She comes from a family of pearl divers. She'd be the only woman on this barky who actually knows how to swim. She'd been promising to teach the rest of us. She's dived up and down this coast and knows a ton of knowledge about the area. She's fascinated with dead cultures that used to be here before the white man arrived. Be careful not to ask her about any dead society or she'll talk your ear off. She was orphaned when British privateers killed her family and stole her family's ship. The only reason she escaped is because she was diving for pearls at the time of the attack. We took her in, and we're glad we did, even if it is just for the never-ending supply of clams and oysters she brings up. The short-haired blonde threw her muscular arms around April. I've never heard my own plight told to me. Thank you for all your kind words and nice meeting your husband finally. If you have the time, Captain, there's a fascinating shipwreck around here to dive. April responded, not right now. 
We are on our way to Charlestown to finally get some long-awaited answers. Captain Reed pointed up. Up there in the rigging is where Seamus's hammock is. That crazy Irishman gave me the captain's quarters to live in while he sleeps in the wind. Oh, and over there, those shirtless sailors relaxing and holding hands are Mr. Michael and Mr. James, the men Seamus rescued. They both waved as they sipped their grog from colorful wooden cups they recently painted. The captain continued to stroll around the deck making introductions. Patrick still found it odd being introduced as her husband, but found himself enjoying it after a while. Because we have so many ladies, we added two private shit hatches down in the bow of the ship. Anyone can relieve themselves out of these small holes. The shit and piss falls right into the water. Of course, the stubborn men sailors still use a piss dale. I always found the large lead buckets disgusting, and they stink up the ship, too. I told them that if they continued using the piss dale instead of the head, they would be the ones bucketing out all the shit and piss when it's full, April insisted. She walked to the helm and quickly became out of sorts. Sailing master, report, the captain yelled. Sam ran over to discover what she was upset with. April was very mad. Are you trying to curse us all? You want to put a vex on this whole voyage? Why the hell is the compass out of its binnacle box? You know the compass is run by spirit magic. You know, I remind you, it is always to remain in its wooden box, or its magical properties will curse us all. Sam belted back. Captain, one of the children must have removed it. Hell, I still can't find the sounding weight and the chip log. I'm pretty sure a couple of those kids are playing with them. You'll have to keep those children away from the equipment or it'll maroon us all. Miss Bias needs to be controlling these little sea monsters. I will get her some hands to help. See if the whore Margie is available. She seems to have a high tolerance for the wee little one's antics. As the sun started setting, Patrick saw his sister Garland and Isaac studying a small tour the large man always carried on him. It was nice to be at sea again, he thought, as his wife hugged him from behind. After an hour of morning sex, the captain and her husband ventured topside. Look there. April handed Patrick the spyglass. That is Charlestown. Do you see the brick wall facing the water? Fall the wall to the middle and you'll see part of it is half moon shape. The building sitting on top of it is where the pirate prisoners were kept and hung. This is hallowed ground for us pirates. Lots of souls I knew died dangling on those galleys. I can picture my friends trying anything to steal the keys to get out of their cells. One of my good friends, Steed Bonnet, was hung in this town at White Point, right there at the tip of the peninsula, she pointed. I was whoring in Nassau when I met him. He was sailing with Blackbeard then, but he went on to get his own barky. He told me he actually bought his pirate ship just to get away from his nagging wife. Funny, I used to make jest and call him the gentleman pirate, just because he bought a ship instead of stealing one. But now I find myself doing the same thing. Life is funny like that. I really do miss that man. Join me as we throw a shot of rum into the sea and show respect for their spirits. She uncorked a jug of rum, poured a mug, and flicked the liquid into the sea. Don't ever let me forget to do that, husband. We must do it every time we see that prison, she stated reverently. We're going to land in the exact spot that the original settlers landed all those years ago. It used to have dirt ramparts and cannons to fight off the Spanish. All that's left these days are the palisade walls and a plantation. We have paid the owner enough silver to ignore us coming and going on his land. I'll put on my more conservative outfit and cover me skin. I will also use my proper lady voice so as not to arouse suspicion. Hell, I might even wear a hat just for you, she smiled. The ship sailed in the marsh, up a small river, to the original landing site of the colony. The two left the ship, and April instructed her crew to remain anchored until they returned. After a long walk, Patrick and April approached perhaps the oldest tavern in Bordello in the southern colonies, and Seamus's favorite stop in all of Charlestown. It was a small, three-story building that stood out because of its pink exterior made with Bermuda stone, a coral stone with a natural pink tint. Mulatto Alley, in which the Pink House Tavern was located, stunk of booze and urine in the rising heat and humidity. The smells mixed with other vivid aromas that made anyone want to vomit. 
hungover men from sailors to gentlemen and plantation owners stumbled around groaning about having to start their day. Patrick opened the door to the tavern and the bartender barked at him that they were closed for the next two hours to clean up. Good sir, we just need to eat and have a bit of refreshment and we'll be on our way, Patrick stated as he ushered April inside. All right then, come on in. We have some beef pasties with some spiced apples already made, said the bartender as he opened the door to the small courtyard in the back. Here, have a seat out there. I know it's hot out, but it's much hotter in here with the fire going for the stew and more pasties. That sounds wonderful, sir. April chimed in, oozing her charm to make the bartender loosen up a bit. She dressed in her best lady's attire, a mantua with a pastel floral pattern in a peach petticoat to match. She noticed he kept looking at her hat and hair and decided that would be how she would work him over, assuming the barkeep had a thing for hair. Tell me, sir, what is your name? April asked, untying her hat ribbon and setting her hat down on the table. Leo, ma'am, he said as he unabashedly stared at her hair curled and pulled back. Patrick shot April a glance, and she gave him a wink to let him know to follow her lead. Well, Leo, she began as she unpinned and untied the ribbons holding back her hair. This released her silky mane around her face and over her shoulders, bringing one's eyes straight to her exposed cleavage. We are unfortunately in a bit of a rush. You see, we're looking for someone that lives in Charlestown. Leo was staring still, and his jaw had dropped a bit. April knew she had him right where she wanted him. Leo, Patrick interrupted. Oh, uh, yeah, yes, sir. Leo snapped, drawing his attention away from April's luxurious hair and cleavage. Might we have some spirits with our meals? Patrick asked. Oh, right. Of course, right away. The bartender disappeared for a moment, and Patrick looked at April with a sly grin. Oh, my dearest wife, you know how to work us menfolk quite well, he said, grabbing at her. Living the life I have lived, I had better, or I would not be alive right now. She smiled. Patrick and April surveyed their surroundings in this tiny, sandy space. Some old playing cards were tossed in the corner, along with some dice and a broken mug. There were also some ropes coiled up by the wall. Patrick could only giggle, remembering Seamus' story about how they used to sneak pirates and sailors alike over the sea wall into the tavern. <laughs> oh boy, that was a big one. Sounds could be heard from the open windows above of women laughing and patting out their makeshift mattresses. The bordello in the whores, no doubt, April thought to herself. What a shanty compared to her own place back in Savannah. The entire size of the bottom floor was all of a dozen steps. She couldn't, or rather she didn't want to, imagine what it was like for them up two floors above in those crammed quarters. She, too, remembered Seamus's constant recounts of his tryst up those stairs for a bit of sex and even hiding in a space in the roof. Leo reappeared with two plates of large pasties and a serving of sliced apples. The smell reminded Patrick how hungry he was. Keeping up with April's sexual appetite required constant sustenance. Now for your drinks. We have some brew made at a plantation just outside the city. Tis very good. Would you like a couple of glasses of that to try? Sounds charming, Leo, April replied. Thank you. The bartender brought two large mugs full of frothy booze and sat them on the table. Now then, since you're square with your meal, you mentioned you were looking for someone. Indeed we are, Leo. April sipped on the sweet brew. Patrick looked on and was nearly embarrassed at how the bartender fell for her womanly wiles. He watched her throat move as she swallowed, and he watched her chest heave for breath in between gulps. Leo took in every seemingly minuscule move she made. Patrick wondered how this man survived working in a tavern in a whorehouse if he fell for a woman as easily as this. But then again, April Reed was an intoxicating lady. The scarred-faced man suddenly caught himself staring at her just like the bartender, as April finished off her pint. Oh my, April exclaimed. That was a good brew indeed. Thank you so very much, Leo. She wiped the throb from her mouth and turned her body to sit directly facing him. We are looking for a Mr. Francis Dandridge. Do you know him? Leo nodded. Aye, that I do. 
His brother-in-law is a lawyer that got mixed up in some land dealings around these parts. They helped settle a few disputes for us. I think I saw them in town early today. He and John, ah, his brother-in-law, John Prue, were paying a visit to the powder magazine. Oh, wonderful. I'm so glad we will not miss him. But first, I want to sink my teeth into this wonderful smelling meal. Might have another pint of brew. Indeed, ma'am. "'Twould be my pleasure. "'Hey, my love,' Patrick whispered to April as Leo walked away to retrieve another drink. "'Might you get us all this food and drink for free while you're at it?' April cut him a look he did not care for. "'I was just saying,' he trailed off. The tavern keeper returned with April's refill. "'Leo, my boy, would you care to sit with us?' Patrick asked. "'Oh,' he stammered, not knowing how to react. "'Um... I don't think I should. Oh, that's nonsense, April stated. Sit and have some conversation with us. We don't like quiet, and working here doesn't make you a leper. Come on now, sit with us. April shot him a dazzling smile and patted the chair next to her, leaning over, exposing her cleavage. He complied and sat next to April. So how do you know Francis? Well, it's like I said. He helped with some legal issues and land disputes around these parts. Mr. Prue did all the official work, but Mr. Dandridge did all the legwork, mediating and making the deals. It's because of him we still have a job, really. See, most of the rich folk coming over from England don't like this place, at least not publicly. I see many of their faces here at night, but once the sun is shining, they're nowhere near this alley. Patrick and April listened intently. They need to get a feel for Francis to see if he's someone they could trust. Leo smiled. He was reveling in this type of company. The pair appeared to be well off, and people who are well off didn't talk much to his kind. April continued using her womanly wiles to coax more backstory from the bartender about his life. He was abandoned in London as a child and stalled away on a ship bound for the Caribbean. He was discovered and sold to a plantation owner in Barbados. Leo was bought as an indentured servant and worked with the slaves on a sugar plantation. It seemed many common folks that Patrick kept meeting came over as an indenture, too. After his seven years of servitude, he was released, and then he bartered passage to Charlestown with the silver his former master gave him. When he arrived, he found himself at the Pink House Tavern and lost what was left of his silver to a foul-mouthed Irishman. The mistress, running the bordello, took mercy and hired him as a barkeep. He'd been working there ever since, tending the bar, helping with cooking and cleaning, and serving as the counter-watch watchman. He explained the rich socialites in Charlestown kept trying to shut down the pink house and other places of known debauchery. They used citizen patrols and started their own watch. When Leo saw a patrolman coming close, he would alert the ladies and patrons up in the bordello, and they would hide in a storage space high up in the roof. Patrick and April could only grin as they matched pieces of Seamus's stories with Leo's. So, ma'am, the tavern keeper said, still smiling at the company he had at the moment. What's your interest in Mr. Dandridge, if you don't mind me asking, that is? Patrick looked at April. She had to be careful in her response. Well, an old friend of ours said he could possibly help us with something. It's kind of private, you know. Okay, ma'am, no worries. I was just trying to keep the conversation going. I admit I'm enjoying speaking with you. Leo looked at Patrick. And your kind husband, ma'am. Oh, I'm not worried at all, my dear Leo. What's your friend's name? If he knows Mr. Dandridge, I might know him as well. Without thinking, she blurted out, Seamus. Seamus Red. April stopped talking as soon as she saw the bartender's face. He had turned bright red, and that soft smile was now pressed into a frown. He began breathing heavy, and the blood vessels in his temples and neck began to pop out. Leo, my dear, are you all right? April laid a hand of concern on his forearm, but he stared at her hand in disgust. Out! Get out now! Leo screamed as he stood up and swatted April's hand away. There ain't no person on earth that can be a friend to that monster. That drunken, annoying Irish bastard swindled a lot of good folks out of their hard-earned silver. Get out now. Leo's chest and shoulders were heaving with full, deep breaths, and his fists were clenched tight. 
Patrick pulled his purse of silver out of his jacket and threw it on the table. Thank you for your meal and help, good sir. He grabbed April by the arm and pulled her out of the tavern. They could hear crashing sounds and breaking glass as they ran away. They had to leave Milano Alley quickly before too much of the wrong attention was garnered from the temper tantrum Leo was now fully engaged in. What a damn fool! April exclaimed as they turned the corner onto Meeting Street, heading toward the powder magazine. What in this world would cause a man to act like such an infant? Well, April, Seamus is involved, so it's very likely it's justified, her husband replied. She was trying not to smile, but once Patrick smiled, they both laughed and ran to Cumberland Street, where the magazine was located. Once they arrived, they saw a cart pulling away. Fearing it was Francis, they ran to the door of the magazine. Sir, who is that gentleman that just left? Patrick asked. Who is asking? The proper dressed man rebutted. I'm sorry, my name is Mr. Freeman, and I am looking for Francis Dandridge. We were told he may be here with his son-in-law, Mr. John Prue. The gentleman surveyed Patrick and looked at April. She suddenly realized her hair was down, and she had left her hat in the tavern. Not the ladylike appearance that she had tried to keep while in Charlestown. I'm John Prue, and yes, that was my brother-in-law, Francis Dandridge. What may I do to help you? Patrick smiled and extended his hand, hoping to receive the secret handshake of the Freeman Society. John smiled, grabbed his hand, and shook. No, John was obviously not in the club and not to be trusted. We need to speak with Mr. Dandridge about a business proposition. It's quite urgent we see him, as time is of the essence. Ah, new business. We're always looking for new business. If it's here in the city, then I may assist you as I handle all Francis's affairs in the city. Oh, uh, no, sir. This is about Indigo, Patrick answered. The Whoremaster Darden found out that Dandridge was successful in Indigo, and it would be a good fallback to keep nosy people from prying for more information. I see. That is definitely not my cup of tea, then. Here, I'll draw you a map to his plantation in Stono. That is in St. Paul's Parish in Collington County. Do you know where that is? No, sir. If it's far, then we'll need a carriage we can hire to take us there. Indeed, sir. In fact, come with me and I'll have my servant take you there. We renamed him Linus to give him a less African feel. Is that well? Very well, Mr. Prue. Thank you, Patrick replied. They followed John to his house and he summoned a slave, not a servant, something Patrick was not accustomed to seeing. Linus, take them to the Francis plantation straight away. He was with me, but these two just missed him as he left the powder magazine. Yes, sir, the well-dressed slave responded. The carriage was ready, and within minutes the pair was finally heading to see Dandridge. Being from Savannah, where slavery was still illegal, Patrick was finally exposed to a typical life of a Carolina slave. The way they were bought, sold, and inherited, just like cattle, did not sit well with them. April did not care for the silence and struck up a conversation with Linus. After a few minutes, the slave was feeling more at ease with Patrick and April as they rode further away from Charlestown. The slave shared the heartbreaking story of his cousin in Dorchester. Just a month ago, he was hung in a gibbet because he was accused of poisoning his master. The slave owner was a philanderer, and his angry wife knew it. Linus dared to think that maybe, just maybe, it was the scorned woman who poisoned her husband, and not his relative. His cousin was an easy scapegoat because paranoia against slaves still ran high after the revolt in Stono just a couple short years ago. Patrick remembered the revolt that Alec and Gloria had survived and was grateful they had not fallen to a similar fate. April, being a pirate, knew what it meant to be killed in a gibbet. No one should die that way, starving to death in an iron cage, especially an innocent man. They turned down the main road and began down a road that was lined with planted fields. To the right was tobacco, and to their left was indigo, growing taller than Patrick. The odd plants were filled with what April could only describe as pink and green tiny bananas. Linus laughed at the reference and explained that those were the flower buds, and later, seed pods. She had to explain to Patrick that bananas were a sweet fruit grown in the Caribbean and even further south. She promised to get her husband some of the wonderful yellow fruit in the future. 
they approached a two-story home built up on a small hill to keep it from being flooded by the nearby tidal creek. They could survey about a dozen slaves in the fields and saw a blonde woman on a porch reading to some children of all colors. This woman looked up and smiled. Hello, Linus. How are you? Well today, Miss Elizabeth. How are you? Very well. Thank you for asking. Mr. John asked me to bring these two to see your husband. Has he returned? He has, and he'll be here as soon as his cart's unloaded. We all please come inside for some water. Thank you, ma'am, Patrick said. Children, we'll finish this up later. You all get back to your chores now. The children giggled and scattered, some with water buckets to take to the slaves in the fields, and others with brooms and mops to clean the porches. Please come in, Elizabeth said, opening the door for her guest. You have a lovely home, April said as she entered. Oh, thank you, my dear. It's not much to look at now, but we work hard to keep a roof over our heads and feed all those that depend on us. Please have a seat and I'll bring you some cool water. Linus, you too. Please sit. Thank you, Mrs. Elizabeth. Elizabeth quickly returned with a tray of cups filled with water. I would offer you some tea, but it's so terribly sticky outside, I can't imagine drinking something so hot right now. No, ma'am, Patrick said after a sip. This is perfect. A tall gentleman in dirty clothes, unruly brown hair and bright green eyes entered the house. He was startled by the sight of company, but smiled when he saw Linus. Linus, did you miss me already? Yes, sir. Always, Mr. Francis. <laughs> Linus replied, laughing. And what do we have here? Linus stood up and gestured toward the pair on the lounge. This is Mr. and Mrs. Freeman. They wish to speak to you about business with Indigo. They tried to catch you at the magazine, and Mr. John offered me to bring them here to meet you. Thank you, Linus. Might you go help Elizabeth with dinner since we have extra company? Yes, sir, the slave said with a slight bow. Feel free to stay for dinner, Linus. You know you're always welcome here. Thank you. Mr. Francis and Mrs. Francis need me at home right now since Mr. John works late. She don't like being home alone. I understand. Do give him my love again. Yes, sir. Linus replied as he left the room for the kitchen with Elizabeth. Francis turned to his guest as Patrick and April stood. Patrick held out his hand and was relieved to receive the Freeman's secret handshake. This isn't about indigo, is it, Mr. Freeman? Francis asked in a hushed tone. Can we talk more privately? Patrick asked in a whisper. Francis nodded and escorted them up the stairs to his own bedroom. April introduced herself and explained her connection to the former great pirate, better known as Anne Bonny. Francis quickly explained that her father had brought her out of imprisonment and brought her and her newborn daughter back to Charlestown. Her father had already arranged a marriage to a local plantation owner by the name of John Burley. Anne's daughter, by Rackham, was named Mary, in honor of her lost and beloved friend Mary Reed. Burley had officially adopted her as his own daughter. Since then, Anne and John have had seven more children, the youngest being only two years old. The fearsome pirate had secretly settled into a life on a plantation. It was a smaller one, but they frequented parties at the larger plantations due to the large inheritance that Anne got from her father. She enjoyed the attention she gained at these gatherings. Can you tell us how to get to her home, then? Patrick asked. I can, but she's not there. April's expression dampened. Don't worry, Francis continued. She's not far from here. She's at Drayton's plantation on the Ashley River. There's a fowling party that started today and will likely last until tomorrow. I will give you directions and a carriage. I'll have to empty it, though. It's still got a few things loaded on it from my visit to Charleston today. He wrote out some instructions on how to get to the Drayton Plantation just as Elizabeth began the call for supper. Stay tonight. Eat supper with us. Sleep well. You may journey in the morning. I was really hoping to see her now. April said with disappointment. I understand. However, you do not want to be out at night. There's always risk of running afoul with some thieves in the night. Please, I beg you both, stay here tonight. Had Anne been home, you could have seen her tonight. 
but I don't want you traveling to Drayton in the dark. He speaks wise words, my dear wife, Patrick said as he smelled the heavenly food. You are right, my wolf, she sighed deeply. Before the four of them could sit down to eat, Patrick could not help himself and had to ask about the Dandridge's slaves. I have no experience as a slave master, but I doubt any others are as friendly and respectful to their slaves. I even saw Elizabeth teaching the young ones how to read. We tell most people who ask that. It is because educated slaves are worth more, and we are building our investment. Honestly, though, it is because we found out if you treat them with kindness and respect, they work harder. If you give them just a little taste of freedom, and they believe they are free, they're much more productive, Dandridge explained. April cut in. My dear husband, most rulers have used that line of thinking for years. Everyone who lives in the colonies is a slave to a degree. Being a slave means someone else takes your labor by threats or force. When any king or government taxes you, they be doing just that, taking your labor by threats and force. The only difference between the Dandridges and Linus is the percentage of their labor that is stolen by someone else. If you think about it, we all live on one giant plantation with a few elite politicians owning us all. She is dead reckoning with her thoughts. I see why you married her. It really tears at our morality and attacks our conscience about owning slaves. We hope to find another way some day to run a farm profitably without them. But right now, I have no idea what that way is, Mr. Dandridge confessed. The rest of dinner was filled with lively debate about ideas of liberty. He and April slept well in the main house and arose to a large breakfast. They ate and dressed in fancier party clothes provided to them by Francis and Elizabeth. They bid their goodbyes to their new trusted companions and left behind this grand land, heading along the river to the Drayton Plantation. They couldn't believe what they saw when they arrived. There were high society people everywhere and so many slaves they couldn't even guess how many there were. The fields were expansive and they were growing so many things that neither April nor Patrick could identify most of the crops. A house slave boy offered to stable their horses and cart, and Patrick asked him if he knew the Burleys. The boy nodded and pointed toward the river. Is Mr. Burley shooting today? Patrick asked. The boy laughed. <laughs> no, sir, of course not. Miss Burley always shoots. <laughs> April laughed out loud as the boy led the horses away. That is certainly not a surprise. They approached the fowling party along the river and watched as a clay ball was thrown into the air. On the way to the river, many slaves could be seen beating the scrub brush. Some game would spring out, and two aristocratic socialites would fire their fowlers. The firelocks were extremely long and fancy, lighter muskets. Recently, fowling was all the rage in upper-class society, and it was a status symbol to own one of these ornate guns. The muskets were loaded with small bird shot, and people were absolutely amazed to see a bird hunted right out of the air. April chuckled as she saw a slave holding a very popular book called Terraplegia or The Art of Shooting Flying, while a nobleman socialite was reading it, trying to figure out why he kept missing. The two quickly made their way down to the river. A clay ball was exploded in midair. They followed the smoke to its origin of a classy dog-lock musket in the hands of a black-haired beauty. It was Anne Bonny. At long last, April was looking upon her adopted sister after all these years. Her heart sang and it was all she could do to hold back the tears that were now welling up in her eyes. Anne was laughing and certainly enjoying being the center of attention. The ex-pirate had turned to talk to her husband, but her eyes fell upon April, and the smile on her face dissipated. April motioned Anne over so they would not have listening ears around them. Anne nodded and graciously excused herself to her admirers as she walked over to join the tattooed woman. She looked at the party-crashing woman from head to toe trying to assess her identity. She saw a tattoo of a black cat peeping out of her cleavage and smiled. I thought it was a rumor, but damn me, you're still alive somehow. I can't believe I'm standing before little April Reed after all these years. I'd heard rumors of a tattooed woman who pretended to be a man and capped in her own catch. I thought it'd be too much to hope that you lived through the great pirate extermination, Anne whispered. I thought you died. It was not until recently I found out you and your child were smuggled out and that you've been living a new life as a housemaiden. 
I see you in front of my own eyes, and I feel like I'm conversing with a ghost. Is that really you in there, Anne? April questioned. The former pirate, Bonnie, grinned as she pulled down her neckline, exposing a small black feline on her cleavage. <laughs> Both women giggled and embraced. Look, as much as I would love to host you for days, you're a known woman, and it's not safe for me or my family to be seen with you. I had to leave my past behind. A few people have figured out my true identity, but I always deny it and they can't prove it is me. I am now called Miss Anne Burley, mother of eight and churchgoer, the ex-pirate said proudly. I'm not here to expose you. I just need some information that only you know. A few months before you were all captured and put on trial, Mary made you stop over a day in an island to go bury her take of plunder. I think I can find it with your help. I just need the name of the island in the Caribbean she was held up at. April pleaded. Hmm. Anne looked in the air and scratched her head, trying to recall. Oh, I think you're mistaken. It was no island in the Caribbean she stopped at. But I do remember the island you seek. It used to be called Hilton's Head on my old charts. I think these days people call it John's Island after its current owner, John Caskwine. I had thought many times of the years going to hunt the treasure myself, but Mary Reed never shared with me where she buried it. Good luck finding it. She never left a map, damn her. I'm just dreaming anyway. I could never get away with all my children. Anne smiled as she reflected. The next pirate continued. Speaking of children, I have a wonderful surprise for you. You see that lady over there dressed all fancy like her father? That's Jack's child. I named her Mary after your sister died during childbirth. April grinned and glowed. That was a fine thing you did for Mary. Well, I have one more surprise for you, and it's a big one, Anne smirked. It is true that Mary died giving birth, but her baby did not. I became ward of that little girl. I nursed both of them and brought them back to Charlestown with me when my father purchased my freedom. My parents were mortified about the whole jail incident and wanted nothing to do with Mary's baby. They gave the baby to the slave staff to raise and even named her a different enough name that nobody would ever know it was Mary's child. They named her Nina, and she was a servant until she was married recently to an arse of a man. April stumbled back and held Patrick so as not to fall. This whole time... I've had a little niece, right here in Charlestown. I want to pinch myself. So many times I've smuggled cargo into this city. Been so close to you and Nina and never known. She's right over there with her jackass husband. You need to meet her. Anne shouted towards Nina. Nina, please join us. April sized up Mary's daughter and her husband as she approached. Nina was a lovely thing. Long brown curly hair with some cute sun freckles and a real thin build like her mother. As she got closer, Calico Jack's appearance was obvious in her eyes. My dearest Anne, who are these lovely folks you're keeping all to yourself? Nina expressed friendliness. Dear, I don't know another way to put this, so I'll just say it. This is your real mother's sister. This is your Aunt April, Anne confessed. The thin young woman stared quietly at April, walking closer and taking a good look at her. So it is true. You're really still alive. Please tell me you've come to take me away from this life and my mind-numbing job of serving rude society women. You mind your place, woman. Be glad I rescued you away from the slave house. Her husband reprimanded her. It's true, dear. I love your mother very much and I miss her every day. I just found out about you a minute back or I would have come for you long ago. I had no idea you existed. Hell! Nobody did. I'm truly sorry. She ran over and hugged Nina. All three women had a good cry and hugged each other for a long time. Well, lass, I'm going to make up this lost time to you. Come with us sailing. The tattoo woman offered. Nina's husband cut in. I am Julius Cheshire, and your niece is my property. She's not going anywhere without my say-so. I'm going to hunt down Mary's buried treasure. I figure Nina is due a good share of that gold. April dangled the offer. Gold, you say? Well, now, that is altogether different. I could use that gold to finally establish my family's name in this town. 
Julius calculated. Very good. Let us go get our goal, wife. Nina hugged April and whispered, Thank you, in her ear. Well, lass, you have to leave your things behind and come with us now, the captain commanded. Mr. Cheshire replied, We are ready for travel. I'll buy anything I need with my gold. I mean, our gold, when we return. I would love to catch up more, April Reed, but we are already bringing too much unwanted attention to ourselves. You have to go before the questions start. Nina, I'll explain your sudden departure to your friends. Good luck in your hunt, Anne stated as she gave them one last hug. The group of four left the party and returned the carriage and clothes to Mr. Dandridge. Mr. Dandridge drove the group back to the original landing site of the Charlestown settlers. They said their goodbyes as they hastily made their way back to the Robin. Once aboard, April introduced Nina and Julius to the crew. It only took a matter of seconds before Julius was condescendingly giving orders to the women crew members to bring him food and drink. Sam, we have our heading. Take us to Hilton Head's Island. Sorry, I think people be calling it John's Island now. April ordered. As the Robin sailed into the sunset, Nina and April held hands and shared stories of their lives. Patrick had never seen his wife glow like that before. And at this moment, she was the most beautiful thing on this world.